In ancient times, the Greek bard Homer recounted a heroic tale known as the Iliad that described the long struggle between the Trojans and Greeks over a city named Troy. Thousands of years later, during the American Civil War, a similar struggle took place over a city named Charleston, South Carolina, the Confederacy's queen city, considered to be the jewel of southern ports. Here begins America's sojourn. This is America's Iliad, the siege of Charleston. By this time, the divisions between North and South had become insurmountable, and the country had reached a breaking point. On November 7, 1860, news of Abraham Lincoln's election reached Charleston. Immediately, the Charlestonians erected liberty poles and affixed secession cockades to their clothing. In Columbia, the state capital, a secession convention was called. But when it seemed that it might not vote for immediate disunion, Charlestonians rushed to Columbia and convinced the delegates to move the convention to Charleston. They met in St. Andrew's Hall and on December 20th, 1860, under an intense pressure and scrutiny from the city citizens, the delegates voted unanimously to secede from the Union. With a large crowd watching, they signed the Ordinance of Secession, making South Carolina an independent republic. Charlestonians reveled in their new independence. Emma Holmes, a 22-year-old unmarried aristocrat who was descended from some of the city's oldest and leading families, wrote in her diary. The United States, now at last broken into fragments through the malignity and fanaticism of the black Republicans. Doubly proud am I of my native state that she should be the first to arise and shake off the hated chain which linked us with black Republicans and abolitionists. Secession, said a gentleman, was born in the hearts of Carolina women. For days, Charlestonians celebrated their independence. Parties and rallies were held throughout the city. Congregations from the city's churches and synagogues enthusiastically backed secession. Charleston and its citizens were excited about its future as a free independent society. But this wouldn't last forever. Following secession, Charleston remained the center of activity for the newly formed republic. The city, lying on a peninsula between the Ashley and Cooper rivers, offered an imposing view with its numerous church steeples, domes of public buildings, 
rows of massive warehouses, cotton stores on its wharves, and the bright colors of its houses. In 1860, Charleston had a population of about 40,000. It was the 22nd largest city in the nation and ranked 85th in manufacturing. It was the largest seaport in the southeast and was well served by both railroad and steamship lines. Among its population were 3,200 free blacks and 13,000 slaves. Over half of the city's population consisted of recent German and Irish immigrants who made up the majority of Charleston's laboring class. Although a large city, Charleston had only a small middle class. 155 elite wealthy families who made up 3% of the city's households dominated Charleston. These aristocrats controlled 50% of the city's wealth. South Carolina in 1860 was the third wealthiest state in the nation. It was based upon a plantation economy of rice, sea island cotton, and upland cotton. Uh, Charleston was a fantastically wealthy port, uh, exporting to England and France. And without the slave-based economy and 60% of the population being enslaved, there would not have been the wealth for the port of Charleston. 